are once again inside the Big Tear Garage for another one of our Q&A sessions. Uh, I, can't, I say this every video, might as well say it again. Uh, you know the drill, ask a question, if I answer it, you get a sticker pack, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. First question, I'm gonna jump right into it. First question is from uh, Mr. D. Harris 62. Love the rig, why are more people using Hydro Boost instead of Vacuum Assist? I don't know what rig he's talking about, I can't remember what video I pulled that off, but thank you very much. Probably was the bomber. Um, so, the question is, Vacuum Assist versus Hydro Boost, and I believe, uh, I don't, I haven't done Hydro Boost on one of my rigs, um, um, probably in a long time, um, but it is becoming popular, especially with some of the buggies. So, the two different systems are this. Number one, you have vacuum assist brakes. So vacuum assist brakes uses a vacuum diaphragm. That's a big round thing underneath the firewall that your brake master cylinder is attached to. What happens is uh, when you push on the brake pedal, it uses the engine vacuum to basically pull a big diaphragm inside that round pot. And that assists in the brake pressure. So it allows you to, essentially you're pushing the brake pedal harder. That increases the pressure inside the lines and therefore increases the uh, pressure on the brake calipers and wheel cylinders if you have drum brakes and that allows the vehicle to stop. Um, vehicles didn't always have vacuum assist brakes. Some vehicles have manual brakes. Manual brakes work perfectly fine if designed correctly. So you'll see on a lot of race cars, they'll run a manual brake setup with two small master cylinders and then a lot of big piston calipers. And that works perfectly fine if you've spec the system out correctly. It does require a little bit more pedal uh, pressure to, to push it, but um, if you've sized the master cylinder uh, piston correctly compared to the calipers, you can stop those vehicles quite well. When you get into some of the bigger vehicles, some of the rock bouncers, there's a lot of weight there. So uh, a lot of rock bouncers use what's called Hydro Boost. Now Hydro Boost uses a, a different system. Instead of using vacuum from the engine, what it's actually using is pressure from the power steering pump. Or in some cases, if the vehicle doesn't necessarily have power steering and some heavy equipment applications, um, it just has a pump that's driven by the engine or sometimes an electric pump. Uh, it's basically hydraulic over uh, liquid pressure. So what happens is you're pushing on the brake pedal and there's a hydraulic piston in there that senses that you're pushing, takes pressure from that power steering pump and applies more pressure to the brakes and allows the vehicle to stop. Hydro Boost, you see that quite often in factory vehicles in a lot of diesel trucks. The reason why is because a lot of diesel trucks have uh, superchargers or turbochargers on the smaller ones that we see in pickup trucks. Some of the heavy equipment stuff has actually had superchargers originally, then they went superchargers and turbochargers. Now most of them just use some type of turbo. In a turbocharged engine, no vacuum because the engine is basically pressurized. The intake charge is pressurized, so there's no vacuum to pull. So uh, they use Hydro Boost instead. The benefit of the Hydro Boost is the pressure. The vacuum applies, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably a thousand PSI. And then the Hydro Boost is three to four times that worth of pressure inside the brake system. So for a small amount of pedal effort with a Hydro Boost system, you get a lot more pressure at the wheels to stop the vehicle. Downfall to Hydro Boost, it's a lot more complicated system. So with a vacuum uh, master cylinder or vacuum assisted master cylinder, you simply need a hose from the engine up to the vacuum uh, booster on, that's attached to the firewall and you get additional pressure on your brakes. For the Hydro Boost, you're gonna need the Hydro Boost unit. You're gonna need additional hydraulic lines coming from the power steering pump to go to the Hydro Boost and then usually through the Hydro Boost and then down to the engine. Um, um, the other downfall to Hydro Boost is the minute the engine is shut off, you lose that additional pressure. So usually Hydro Boost vehicles also have what's called an accumulator. So it has a small little, basically looks like a, almost like a giant battery attached to the bottom of it. It's not a battery, that's an accumulator. The accumulator stores up pressure. So if the engine does shut off, you do have a couple pumps of the brake pedal with that additional pressure to get the vehicle stopped. The vacuum assist brakes, uh, same thing, you'll have a little bit of extra pressure if the vehicle turns off, 
as the vacuum bleeds out, but it's the same thing, couple pumps and you're done. Uh, the reason that it's more important to have that in the HydroBoost system is because the HydroBoost system is usually on vehicles that are often very large and very heavy, so they've basically built that into the system. We have two to three stops on the vehicle if the engine's not running, or if you have a failure with the HydroBoost system, you have a line that loses fu fluid or something like that. Um, Really, the main benefit, the guy, reason guys are going to it is simply that, more brake pressure. So it's, it's quicker, it's higher pressure, stops the vehicle faster, and it's less pedal effort. Easier for you inside the buggy. There's a bunch of busted knuckle off-road, I believe, makes a kit, a uh, Hydro Boost bracket kit that allows you to basically simply bolt it in, weld it into your tube buggy, and away you go. I've used both systems. I've done manual brakes on cars. I've done vacuum-assisted brakes. I've done Hydro Boost brakes. I've built cars that have a diesel engine with a small vacuum pump. The R2.8 allows you to still use the vacuum booster, so it has a small vacuum pump to do it. Uh, really, honestly, it's personal preference. It's really your choice. There's benefits and drawbacks to both systems. They both work well. It really boils down to which system you want, which system you think will work best for you. Heavy truck stuff, obviously, usually always goes Hydro Boost. All right, here we go. Next question is uh, ABPSD73. I don't know if that spells anything. Speaking of axles, I have a Toyota pickup front solid axle with a slight bend in it that's throwing off my camber on one side, one and a half degrees between spring perch and knuckle. What is the best way to fix it? I'd get an aftermarket housing, but they are usually three inches wider or more, and I want to retain stock width. So can you straighten an axle housing? Absolutely you can. All you need is a press um, and a way to fixture the axle housing itself. So normally what you would see in a case like that is if I was trying to straighten that axle, what I would probably do would be take the axle out of the vehicle. Um, if, it's, if it's between the spring perch and the knuckle, that's where you want to fixture it. So turn it upside down, somehow attach it to the shop floor or a workbench or something that'll keep it from going up. So flip it upside down, put it on some jack stands, put a jack stand right at that spring perch, put another jack stand at the other end, throw some chains around it, chain it down to that bench or at least to the jack stand itself or something. Get a small bottle jack and then you're just going to jack up the outer, uh, outer end where it's bent and you're just going to basically bend it up and you have to bend it past where it's bent so you're probably going to go a couple degrees up and then relax it. You know, it shouldn't need any heat, you shouldn't need any additional things other than just pressure and time. Just go really, really slow when you're doing it. Uh, one thing that you could do to ensure that that doesn't happen, uh, to ensure that it's straight, it'd be ideal if you could get some sort of alignment bar in there. So maybe ask around some of your friends, see if they have an alignment bar um, that you could put in that axle when you're done to check it for straight. And then at that point, it'd be a good idea to probably gusset that housing up because obviously it has bent there for a reason. I'm assuming it probably landed on a big drop or something and that tire hit and the spring stopped and that basically bent the axle up. Um, so as I said before, you should be able to straighten it back out, maybe put some sort of backbone uh, gusset on that. Um, it's not hard work straightening an axle, it just takes time and effort and it's a little bit tricky and just go slow. You're basically just bending metal. It's no different than bending tune for a roll cage. You need a jack, and a way to fixture that axle. I don't think you could do it in the car. I don't think the I don't think the leaf springs would hold it enough. I think if you tried to like figure out a way to just jack it with a jack and push down on a port of power, all that's going to happen is just going to twist around. You got to get the, that axle out of the car and get it fixtured down with some chain or something that's basically going to hold it and keep it from moving, and then jack that knuckle up. Uh, good luck with fixing it. Um, there is a place called Zombroda Drivetrain. Uh, you could send it to them. They would straighten it, um, but that's going to mean shipping the axle. I don't know where you are, but you're going to have to send it away. Uh, but I would call around and see if there's anybody in your area that may straighten it. Look for like heavy truck shops and stuff like that, because they may have basically axle straightening jigs. Start there, uh, and I wish you the best of luck. Next question. This is from Steve Miller 5525 Do you balance your tires on the rigs that you street use, and what do you think about balance beads? I see the balancer in the background. Well, thank you, Steve Miller. Um, really, it depends on the vehicle. So if I'm building something that's got true functional bead locks on it, a um, uh, perfect example, the shop truck. The shop truck has bead locks on it, like actual bead lock bead locks. I didn't balance those tires. I just put them on. Uh, just to see how they work, and they went down the road perfectly, 
straight and true and, and runs great down the highway. Now, I'm not doing like 80 miles an hour. You know, I'm doing 65, 70 on the highway, and I've never really had an issue. I think what it boils down to, nine times out of 10, it's actually the tire itself. So BFGs, Nittos, Maxxis, good quality name brand tires on those larger tires, especially on like a 40 on a 17. I feel like there's enough sidewall give in there that um, I've never really had to chase out of balance in it. I've never really felt like a shake in the wheel or any type of out of balance situation. If they sit for a long time and you drive them, sometimes I will feel a flat spot that gets picked up by the tire. But nine times out of 10, what I do more is I play around with the air pressure in those tires. So if it's on a true functional beadlock, I'll drive the car, see how it feels. I may put a little bit of extra air in it, a little bit of air out of it. I, I don't just put 35 pounds on it if I'm driving in the street. I base it off every vehicle add a little air, take a little air out, see how it works with different air pressures to see how it drives and see how it feels. Now, on a vehicle that I don't have functional bead locks on, yes, I balance them. Uh, I used to use uh, stick on weights and balance weights and all that kind of stuff. And that's why I have a balancer in the shop, mainly for street tires, for my son's car or anything I've got that I just want to change tires myself. Um, but I use balance beads. I'm very, very happy with the results I've gotten with the balance beads. Uh, they're in the battled wagon, they're in the Colorado, they're, uh, gosh, I can't think of, there were four or five different vehicles. I put three scoops of balance beads inside uh, the tire and wheel, and they do, they work great. Uh, I've never had an issue with them. You can hear them sometimes when you're spinning the tire on the lift, uh, but they seem to work really well. What sold me on balance beads was this, and someone told me this. I had sent a set of tires and wheels out to get installed and balanced, and he put balance beads in it. Um, this was before I had my tire machine. Uh, and his, he said to me, oh, I put balance beads in this because I figured if you're gonna air it down, going rock crawling, chances are you're gonna pop a wheel weight off or something, and then when you air it back up, it's gonna be all off anyway. Or when you air it down, it sometimes changes the, literally can change the shape and the, uh, of the tire slightly, and then when you air it back up, if you don't air it up to the exact same amount that it was aired up when you balance it, the balance is gonna be off. Lots of reasons how that balance can change on the vehicle after a day of four-wheeling. And that made perfect sense to me. So ever since then, that's all I've used on a vehicle that I'm trying to balance beads. I just get my balance beads from Amazon. Uh, I put three scoops in a 37 or a 40, and I've had very, very good luck with them. I'm very happy with it. So yes, I would suggest balance beads in something. Um, like I said, sometimes you hear them, sometimes you don't. We used to literally throw golf, golf balls in the tires. That was an old trick we used to do all the time on, on stuff. We'd just throw three or four golf balls in the tires and that would sort of help with the balance. Now you definitely heard those. Every time you came to a stop, you'd hear them kind of bouncing around inside the wheel. That was kind of fun. So there you go. Those are the three questions. Now it's time for the where is it now question. Now this project vehicle isn't that old. Uh, someone asked about my T6500 uh, semi truck that I bought um, that was the Tover Lander build on four wheeler. Where is it? What's the status of it? All that kind of fun stuff. So the Toverlander, it's right outside. Um, I st it's on the list to get built. It's definitely going to get done. I love the idea of it. Uh, I still, in my heart of hearts, I still kind of want to make it four-wheel drive. So for those of you that don't know, the Toverlander is a GMC T6500. I brought it in on four-wheeler and basically went through the truck, talked about it. We started building, it has a Freightliner uh, sleeper on the back and we started to build out a new, uh, an expansion on that sleeper with some aluminum tubing. And we're basically gonna build an additional bed on the back, kind of make like a ultimate off-road overlandy type camper. I just love flat nose semi trucks. I don't know why, I think they're super cool. Couldn't say no to that one. The story behind that one, was I was actually, a gentleman sent me a message uh, via email, said, hey, can this truck be turned into a four wheel drive? And I was like, everything can be four wheel drive with enough money. Uh, he said, well, I've got this thing for sale on racing junk. Nobody wants to buy it. And I was like, well, what is it? He told me the price he threw at me blew my mind. He wanted $5,000 for it. $5,000 for a GMC T6500. It's legit a semi truck. It's already been titled as an RV. So it's been gone through the, he went through the process of basically being a title as an RV, has a Cat 3126 Allison four speed automatic. It is two wheel drive. That's the only thing. I started looking at making a four wheel drive and I thought I found the axle that I wanted to put in it. And I, I just, it, I can't find one. It's a Meritor axle. Uh, I want the disc brakes on the front and I just couldn't find it. So now I'm at the point of 
still trying to figure out if I can make it four-wheel drive. In an ideal world, that truck would be four-wheel drive just because I think it would be way cooler if it was four-wheel drive. I just got to figure out how I'm going to do that. I think in the meantime, the plan will be to build out the box in the back and then worry about it later. I've often thought about just swapping an entire one-ton truck drivetrain into it. So front axle, rear axle, engine transmission transfer case, which could be an option because I don't, I think, I think I could probably sell that 3126 cat to somebody who would use it because I'm definitely not going to be pulling 80,000 pounds or whatever it was designed to pull. I just want it to be diesel, four-wheel drive and be cool. So that's where that truck is now. Yes, I'm still going to finish it. I love the look of that truck. I just uh, got to find a few more parts before I can jump on it. And I got a couple other trucks to knock out first. But yes, that's where that truck is. So once again, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for the questions this week. Uh, uh, make sure you send me your address. If you've heard your question, get answered. BigTireGarage at gmail.com and I'll get you a sticker pack out in the mail. We'll see you next time.